it's the purpose that keeps me in moving in a specific direction and is connected to my passion. And when those two work together in concert, you can go really far, baby. What's up, people? You're listening to A Quick Read, an advertising podcast that talks book smarts and street smarts with the people who have been there, done that. Today's guest is Chris Doe, founder and CEO of The Future and brand strategy design consultancy, Blind. He flips the script with Marty Newmeyer's The Brand Flip while teaching one billion people how to make a living doing what they love. You know what to do. Tune in and turn up. What's up, my man, Chris? How you doing? I'm doing great, Brandon. Good talking to you. Awesome, man. I'm so I'm so excited you're you're on the show. Obviously, you're out there. You're all over the internet's, man. No matter where you look, you're out there. You got videos, tutorials, podcasts. You're trying to reach a billion people and change their lives, right? Is that the thing? That is right. So you got to be everywhere if you want to try to reach a billion people. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to have you on the show today, and uh, and you picked a really great book. So you went you went with the brand flip by Marty Newmeyer. Why'd you pick that book for the, for the show today? Well, I wanted to make sure I had a book that I was familiar enough that I can talk to you off the cuff. And I've been a big fan of Marty Newmeyer. He's written several books, and I had to just pick one. So this is the one, and I think it, it's a good summary overview of all the books that he's written before, including the Brand Gap, the Designful Company, and Zag. Yeah, no, definitely. Brand Gap, I thought was awesome. I remember reading that years ago. Uh, but before we jump into sort of the conversation and hear your journey and sort of design and advertising, let's let's kind of get up to speed. What is the what's the backstory here? Did you kind of wake up one day and and graduate high school or whatever and say, "Man, I'm going to go into design and advertising," or did you come about it a, a different way? You know what? It's not that different than what you just described. Uh, I was prepared <laughs> to do something very different, something very technical, maybe in, in computer science or, or some, some engineering thing. And then I got this really awkward opportunity to go and work at a silk screening shop. And that's when I was introduced to the world of professional designers. Because prior to that point in time, I thought design was a bunch of starving artists. And that one decision to go and work for this man named Brad Shaboya introduced me to a whole nother world and ultimately is why I landed up in at Art Center and then working in design and advertising. Wow, that's cool. So at that point you you kind of, you know, your journey began. Now did you you went to um, <clears throat> did you go to design school before that or was that after that moment? No, that was in high school, and then I went to I uh, went to community college for a year, and then I got my portfolio together, got into art center, and then graduated with a bachelor's in graphic design and packaging. Excellent, excellent. And then from there, did you do any time at any like more traditional agencies, or have you always kind of you know been more on the freelance side? And, and then obviously, you know, you've been building your your empire now. So, uh, but before that, did you did you do any stints with any more traditional agencies? I did. Right before I graduated, a friend of mine, Colleen Mathis, got a job at Colin Weber, an ad agency in Seattle. And um, she encouraged me to apply. And I sent my portfolio in. And to my surprise and delight, I was offered a job. Now, keep in mind, this is before I graduated. So I'm, I decided to take a semester off. I work in ad advertising and was offered a job and thought at that point, my life was set. I was going to finish school and fly back and forth between school and the agency. And ultimately, it wasn't a perfect fit for me. I had spent my four years at Art Center trying to be the best designer I can be. And in advertising, less is more, and I understand why. It's not supposed to be about all the different layers of design that you can put in there. It's about the messaging and the concept. And so I didn't feel like I was being fully utilized uh, in the way that I knew how to to create. Yeah. Now, when you were uh, early in your career, were you working on like brand work? Were you, you know, what kind of work were you kind of starting out on? <clears throat> well, one, once I decided that wasn't right for me, I finished school and I started off on my own. I started freelancing around town, getting whatever kind of gig that I can get. And so naturally, the exposure level, which you're, you're going to have, is like very small clients, uh, mostly editorial post-production facilities here in Los Angeles. And that's what I was doing. And I decided to really quickly focus in on doing motion design and working for big ad advertising agencies making commercials. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, one of the big ideas from the book, the first one that we kind of highlight is this idea that people no longer buy into brands. 
they join them. So when you think about that, that thought, you know, how, how did that play out in your career? How has that been something that you've seen evolve from maybe even the earliest days till, till now? Well, in, in terms of my career, I made a lot of commercials in my life. I, I'd work in advertising on, on the vendor side and uh, I was running my company for 20 plus years. And so I wasn't really involved in the strategic level thinking. Uh, we got a brief, we would write treatments and then either win or not win the job and then produce these commercials. And for a long time, I thought that was just how far I was going to go in my life in terms of my proximity to, an, to a client. But towards the latter part of my company, I started to work with clients directly, mostly out of intrigue and some necessity because we saw that the, the tides were shifting away from the kind of commercials that we made. So I started to develop relationships with clients and doing direct, um, direct marketing and started to understand all the things that agencies do, which is to understand who the customers are, the unique selling proposition, and to build a relationship. And that's when I had to dig deeper to understand branding and what branding is. And so for a lot of people, especially people in my space, they think branding is about the way things look or they think it's one aspect or the other when it's actually the totality of all the experiences that a customer comes in contact with. And so you think about the things that you buy uh, and we're talking about things that are outside of the commodities where there's an equal replacement. So you just buy the cheapest thing. But anything beyond that, it's really about you joining a tribe and you defining who you are, your own identity when you buy the things that you do. And that is really intriguing to me. It made me very self-conscious then all of a sudden, like, why do I prefer this watch over that one or this computer or this car over the other? Because it's really about my identity and how closely I align with the values and principles of the companies and the brands that make the products I love. Yeah. And so at this point in your journey, when you started to really dig a little deeper into brands and working with brands and helping them sort of understand how they could get people to join their brands, is this the point or is this the moment where you decided, I want, I want to help teach other people how to do this or, or have we not gotten that far in the story yet? It's pretty close. Um, there was a couple of years of me doing brand strategy, doing client direct work. But, you know, I just kept thinking to myself, I used to work for agencies. Now I work for clients direct and somewhere in between. And it's just changing whoever it is that signs your ticket at the end of the day. And I, I started to think about, like, what's my life going to be like after all of this? Like, is my entire life meant to do client service work? And I thought there was something more. It just so happened that around the same time as I'm exploring client direct work that I run into an old friend of mine from school. His name is Jose Caballé. And he started introducing me to UX design principles. And the other thing he wanted me to do was to make videos with him. And as a person who is a behind the camera talent, not in front of the camera, um, it was some one of those things where I'm like, no, you do that. I don't want to do this. But he insisted and he was a very difficult person to say no to. And so that's how I reluctantly began making videos. And I, I want to just state this for everyone listening. This is in 2014. I'm 42 years old at this point. So I'm not like a young person like thinking, <laughs> oh, the internet's everything. Social media is something I did not understand. I thought it was very vacuous and something that people did to show off what they do. Yeah. And so you started, you know, the blind was, was started well before, right? So 1995. And then, so you were mm -hmm. working, like you were grinding for a minute, like you were really putting in the work before you decided to launch what now has become your, you know, your megaphone with the future. Is that correct? That's right. So I've been in business now since 1995. So in 2014, that's like 20, no, 19 years, right? That's it's getting up there. So we've been doing this for a long time. And I thought at first, why would I want to make content on YouTube? This is where amateurs hang out. This is where people have a lot more free time than actual work. And so I didn't want to be associated with that. And that's just my own prejudice and short-sightedness. And what I, what I found quickly is that a person like myself with actual real experience working with clients, doing national and international work with Fortune 100 companies, there's a place here for me and I can create content and I can help people. I can help people at all stages in their lives. Many self-taught, many are looking for another thing to get inspired and YouTube happens to be a wonderful place where we can all come together as the watering hole and just share what, what it is that we do. That's really cool. And, and you know, that brings us to, you know, the second big idea in the book, this idea that people are not focused on products, but meaning if I buy this product, what does that make me? 
And it sounds like, you know, we were having a little bit of that conversation of you discovering, okay, what does that mean if I'm on YouTube doing these videos? You know, when, do you think about yourself as a product? You know, I mean, in, in a way you are, I mean, you've, you've, your face is everywhere. Everyone knows who you are. I know clearly all freelancers are, you know, follow your content. You're really building this great brand that's super helpful for people to really monetize their brands and how to build their, their sort of careers. Um, do those questions come into play, you know, for you where like, okay, what is my brand? You know, what is the meaning? Like, and you know, do you think about that, you know, in a different way since you're kind of are the product? Yeah, absolutely. So for many, many, many years, what I did was I worked for other brands, other products, other companies, and did the best that I could to suppress my own biases. And I don't want to inject whatever it is that I'm doing into their their brand because they have a right to do the things that feel right to them. And so it's never been a concern of mine. And, and in fact, I just hid behind the wall of the company as blind as a service provider. There were many of us. It wasn't just me. And I didn't want my voice to be more dominant than anyone else's voice. And, and so, as such, it's like, I just kind of did what everybody else did. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to show up. I'm going to do great customer service. And that's as, as much as I can do. And then you step in front of the camera, all of a sudden you have to become really aware of who you are and how you're projecting your energy because people don't connect with the content. They connect with the person who delivers the content. I'm a big believer in this. There aren't a whole lot of original ideas out there. They're just repackaged and recontextualized for the person and for the time and the audience. And so my business partner at that time, Jose, the one who lured me into making content on YouTube, we kind of looked at each other and like, we're so <laughs> different. We're so opposite. And, you know, he's uh, Puerto Rican and he's loud and self-described obnoxious extrovert. I'm the analytical, uh, quiet, reserved Asian guy. And so we thought, hey, man, you remember this whole TV series called The Odd Couple? That's us. We're the odd couple, Felix and Oscar. And so I'm going to come to set <laughs> with the suit and tie uh, I like wearing suits and ties. I don't have many occasions to wear them, so I like getting dressed up and, and showing up. And I said, Jose, why don't you come in a tunic like with beads from Venice and like be all hippie-ish and, and earthy? And he's like, perfect, that's who I am. Like Burning Man versus the suit. And that's how we played. And that became our character, and that's what people got to know us as. And so there was some um, deliberate uh, impression management, if you will. We wanted to draw the contrast between our two styles or different experiences. And it, it was it was uh, good chemistry, and, and it, it played well on air until it didn't. Yeah. So when we go back to that question, if I buy this product, what does that make me? What do you think, or how do you think your audience views themselves when they say, oh, you know, you know, the, the people who follow the future and, and the brands that you're, uh, that you're a part of, how do you think they view themselves? Or how, how okay. do you want them to view themselves? Yes. I, I think any, any brand's ability to connect with their audience, you have to know who they are. You have to know who they aspire to become. And it's pretty clear to us as to who they are. Uh, we, we think they're creative people and, and not under the traditional definitions of creative. It's like, uh, I forget his name, but... Um, uh, it's a Herbert Simon, the the Nobel writer. Uh, he talked about like uh, design or creativity as a person who invents a preferred solution over an existing one or a preferred scenario or something like that. And so that's what we think of as a person who's creative. So if there's an accounting problem and you invent a preferred situation, then you're a creative person. In my mind, you're a designer. And so we, we have a broad blanket definition of who a creative person is, not traditional, like I make art and, and do things with pixels or paint. But they're, they're, they've gone to school. Some of them have been kind of forgotten or disenfranchised by the schools that they went to. They didn't go to top tier schools or something funny or funky happened. They're career switchers. Uh, they were a repressed creative person, pursued something else, didn't work out in their life, and had decided one day, I want to do this thing, and they stumble mm -hmm. into some of our content. So that's really our audience. It's like the disenfranchised, the forgotten, but they're, they work hard, and, and they're honest and earnest people, and that's who we want to serve. They don't have access to the super expensive private art schools, nor are they that interested in them. We're there for them. We hope to be their champion. Yeah, that's that's such a cool point of view. And and I think it ladders up to this big mission that you put out, this billion dollar, this billion, billion well, I'm sure you're on your way to billion dollar, but uh, this billion uh, person uh, education mission. When, when did you decide to declare that? 
Yeah, there's, there's a story behind that because uh, we had this management meeting and we're sitting in the conference room and, and we're still unsure of who we are. I'm still doing client service work as blind and some of us are dabbling on the future, but not a lot of us. And all of a sudden, everybody's coming on board from the service side. So for the first time, we had no master to please. We, we had to set our own agenda and we kind of had to figure out what was going on. So naturally, there was a lot of confusion, a little argument. And then they asked us, is this about making money or selling courses? Are we a workshop company? What are we? And he said, guys, step back a second here. Here's what I want us to think about. One of my guys, his name is Ben, has a little daughter. And she's like two years old at that time. I said, I'd like for her when she's 17 or 18 and thinking about going to college, for her to be able to consider traditional art school, brick and mortar, or to consider the future. And there would be the same to her with a vastly different price tag. And when I said that, you know, Ben, who was arguing with me, got really emotional. He's like, that's why we do what we do, Chris. It's not for us because it's too late for all of us. We can't change that. And it's too late for my children because they're too old at this point. We need time to build this thing up. And so that night I went home and I thought like, that's a long story to tell. I need to figure out how to tell this story much faster. So I wrote a couple of lines down. I sent it to Ben. He's like, dude, I love this. And initially I wrote, teach a billion people how to make money doing what they love. But to me, it's more than just the pursuit of money. So that's when I changed it to make a living doing mm. what they love because a living is what you define it to be. And it could be about money or it could be a satisfaction or just to know that you're, you're making an impact in the world. However you want to do that, we want to make sure it's long-term sustainable for you and the people that are part of your responsibility. Wow, that's so, that's so awesome. And you know, I bet that feels good to, to, you know, to think of it that way, right? Especially coming from an industry that sometimes feels, you know, sort of like, um, you know, sometimes empty, you know, like I think you're, sometimes you're on set or you're designing something and you're like, is this really, is my entire life boiling down to this, you know, milk carton, um, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So to think about, mm -hmm. you know, changing the future and people's livelihoods, that's gotta be pretty rewarding. It is. And I'm, I have to say too, I just want to, for full disclosure for everybody listening, I've, I've gotten to the point and achieved more than I thought I ever achieved, which also means I've made more money than I thought possible. And so I'm, I'm financially all right. And so when you get to that point in which you have to, uh, you don't have to worry anymore about your physiological needs, food, shelter, and clothing, those kinds of things. What else are you going to do with your life? Like what, what do you want your life to count for? And that's really those kind of questions that I keep asking myself. And so I feel like this, and, and, and this is just me being an immigrant coming from Vietnam as a refugee here to this country and being able to achieve this. It's time for me to stop trying to get more. It's time for me to give more, to figure out like somebody else here, wh whether you're in this country, you're somewhere else, you're struggling to make things meet and you want to live this life and you don't want to be a disappointment to everybody that knows you and has trusted you. I want to be there for them. And I think it was Obama quoting someone else, but like when, when you achieve success, when you're at the top, it's your obligation to send the elevator back down. Mm. And that's what I need to do. I want to send it back down to try to help people. And that's the mission. Wow, man. I love that. Love hearing that. And I can feel that sort of quote gut feeling that you're talking about there. That's kind of the, the third idea in the book that we kind of pulled out is this idea that a brand is a person's gut feeling about a product, service, or organization. You can't control it, but you can influence it. Um, brand is branding is about managing impressions. So, you know, when you think about your career, you know, when you think about, you know, whether it's you know your all's media education company, or you think about the brands you've worked with, um, you know, talk a little bit about how important that idea has been. This idea of how do you tell a client, how do you shape a client that the work needs to tap into that gut feeling? Talk a little bit about that. It is tough. It is really tough. So if we are working with an agency, we're never going to talk about that because it's not really our place to say, hey, this is like the tail trying to wag the dog. The the strategic directors, all the people on the account side have figured that out, know the brand inside and out. And me as a vendor, pretty late in the game here, I'm not going to go tell my clients the agencies to do that. But when I'm working with Client Direct, whether it be a mom and pop business or multi-billion dollar corporation, we're trying to help them find their soul. We got to go back in time and find, find out what the founders were thinking, what change they wanted to impact on the world, and see if we tap into that story. And if we can tell that story and be courageous enough to commit to it, and then I think we can stand for something and stand out. 
Unfortunately, a lot of people and corporations, they don't want to take a stand on anything. They don't want to say anything that potentially can alienate a single customer. And in doing so, I don't think they win the hearts and minds of anyone. Yeah, you'll do until someone else does better. And so it's, it's, a, it's a struggle. And, and luckily for us, we get to meet clients who are looking for that. We want a voice. We want to know who, who we are and what we stand for. And, and through the process of facilitation and sitting down and, and having strategic conversations, and we, we eventually come to a place where I think, yeah, I think we found the soul, the DNA of what it is that you're doing. And we want to be able to help you tell that story to the world in a, in a repeatable story format. Because that's, that's how the stories spread. You got to make it simple. You got to make it easy for people to understand. And you have to make a difference. Yeah. Well, and I think that the, the other thing is to get clients to understand that gut feeling or that, that vibe you're trying to communicate through the work, you got to be able to talk about the work. You know, one of the things I love about a lot of your content that, that I consume, you know, even as a, as a creative director at an agency, I love how you do the role plays and you break down and you really help creatives learn how to talk about the work. And if you're going to sell somebody a gut feeling, (laughs) right, you got to be able to talk about it. And so talk a little bit about that. I think you guys do such a good job with that content. Um, you know, for you, was that something that you've, you've just crafted over time? Because, you know, I love, you know, seeing some of those role play videos of presenting the work and, you know, showing how I think you did a video where you guys were connecting a brand to like an old shipyard and you were, you know, presenting the work as sort of a role play. Yeah. You, were, you were talking about the the sailor and, you know, the his beard and the things he wears and, you know, the the colors and the etchings on the crates, you know, seaside crates, that sort of thing. Um, I, yes. I think that's really important. And I think there's a lot of really great designers out there who make amazing work, but really struggle to talk about it. So I'd love to hear you share with them some of those things you've learned. Like, how do you approach really presenting the work so that the end user feels that gut feeling? Thank you. Yes. So I think we're all natural story consumers. Some of us are natural storytellers. And I think back at the time in which I was much younger, probably like uh, barely 12 years old or something. I remember going through my uncle's LP collection and I didn't know the bands that he was listening to from Chicago to Kiss. This is not part of my era of music. And I'm just looking at the album art thinking, I wonder what the story is about these people. Like, who are these people with lightning bolts across their face? Or what does this chocolate bar have to do? Like, what is this? I don't even understand it. And so I, I made it a game. I would tell my cousins, hey, and I don't know why I was doing this, maybe trying to impress them. Like, you know this band, this is what they're about. And I would tell this story. And I can see in their eyes, like, oh my gosh, this is really cool. So all of a sudden, <laughs> this piece of art, which had no meaning to them, and I just BS my way through all this, I just made up stories. And all of us do this to some degree. Some of us tell little white lies. Some of us daydream and look at clouds and form stories. And we see that we see that this happening. It's a natural phenomenon. And then you forget about this. You go to school, you become an adult, and you forget that imagination is a vital part of your life and your happiness. So for me, it's about tapping into this. Now, having to present ideas to get clients to sign off on things to win pitches, you have to fill the imagination gap. And what I've learned is if you, if you turn the right phrase, you reframe what they're looking at in ways that they cannot unsee what you told them. And it, it could be just the, the sound that birds make, the fluttering of their wings and how it connects to this thing right? Or it could be like a really clever transition, like in your sequence when you're designing it, it goes from A and then before you know it, through some slight of hand misdirection, it becomes something different. In that moment, I think there's this pleasurable response. It's uh, in the book, A Smile on the Mind, that's what's happening. You give them the puzzle, you solve it together, and it results in delight. We're in on the joke. And so when I'm presenting a logo or a mood board like the one that you're referencing, I have to be able to weave a story so it it transcends just being pigment on a piece of paper because that's what it is. Objectively speaking, it's pigment on a piece of paper. And so I I tell them like, you know, uh, for this particular brand, you're out by the sea and I'm inspired by nautical themes and we want to go away from the traditional things. But here's something I've, I've always been intrigued by the topography on sales. And, you know, you notice because those sales, uh, the, the mass is very uh, translucent. And so sometimes the, the topography, you see both sides, the front side and the back side. And as soon as I say that to the client, they're like, that's pretty genius. <laughs> and they like to be in on the joke. They want to be smart. 
and they want to know that they got it too. And so if you have good clients, they recognize that and they're like, yeah, let's go with this idea. So essentially, you're, you're looking at multiple options, but when you can tell a story that resonates with them, where they feel like they're in on the joke, and I'm not saying joke like it's a funny thing, but they're in on the trick, the magic trick, if you will, mm-hmm. and then they bite down on it. And this can be done in very subtle ways, and it can be done in very overt ways. But here's one subtle thing. Like at now, if, you're, if you study design, you understand that there's a hidden symbol in the FedEx logo. But until you see it, you never see it. There's a little arrow that's pointing between the letter E and the letter X. And it's crafted in such a way, I think that's what it is. Maybe I got that wrong, FedEx. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something like that. It's in there somewhere. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and if you look at it, all of a sudden it's like, yeah, FedEx moves things, right? It gets things from point A to point B and it's hidden in there. And when you see that, it's like to, it creates this little pleasurable thing to happen inside your mind. I'm sure they looked yeah. at thousands of word mark letter combinations and that's the one they they resolved on because a it's classic it's using fatura but there's a hidden symbol in there once you see it you can't unsee it yeah no that's cool and and i like what you said there you said subtle ways and overt ways i think a lot of creatives think that when they present their work they have to you know be the don draper and do the big song and dance and all that sort of thing but i think sometimes you know watching you do some of these role plays like you know, you mentioned, you know, being more of an introvert. I think you, you have sort of this relaxed style where you kind of just, you, you talk it in a, in a way that's sort of, you know, to the point and, but there's a little bit of poetry in it, but it's not, you know, this big flashbang sort of thing. So, you know, would you agree with that, that you don't have to be this over the top presenter who's, you know, a Ted talker, you can, you can be somewhat understated, but still do a good job. Absolutely. And if you can be that Ted talker, you have that gift of gab and you know how to turn a phrase and be that person, but there are not that many people out there like that. And unfortunately, people get caught in the other trap, which was is to say a bunch of things and, and get into this art speak theoretical thing. And the, that's, the problem with that is people can smell BS a mile away. When you have to invent things that I'm like, where, what are you talking about? Are we talking looking at the same <laughs> thing here? What's going on? And so rather than go that route, use the economy of words to your advantage. Just pick a few key things like, what is the big idea? And if you don't know what it is, it means that one doesn't exist. So don't go and try to make it up. Go back to the drawing board, try again until you have that idea. Like, what is the conceptual springboard that birthed this moment? Talk about that. Set that part up and then tell them what it is. Now, of course, in a scripted TV show where they control the entire narrative for all all people and they have a ton of time to work on it, it seems brilliant, it seems effortless, and that's probably how it should be. But we all know these are not easy things to come by. You have to sit there and you have to grind at it. You have to crack the, the problem and, and, and slay the beast. And once you do, it's super rewarding. Yeah. And I think when, you, when you're able to make that connection and it clicks, right, you get that lift in the room uh, and people see what you see and everybody's kind of on board, that's that's a beautiful and exciting moment, but we all know that, that that's not always how it goes down, right? <laughs> and so I think the other thing that you guys have done really well, and most recently, I think um, just the other day, I saw a video where you guys role-played um, objections, and I thought that was really fun. You guys kind of had uh, a bell, and whenever you got the objection, oh, yeah. right, you ring the bell. That was pretty funny, but I think that's really important, too, to understand. So you know, when when for the listeners maybe who haven't seen that, talk a little bit a bit about Um, dealing with client objections, you know, so it's one thing to be able to express this gut feeling that you think their brand needs to be. But what happens when you got that one person in the room who's like, "Eh, eh, I don't know, eh, that sort of thing. How do you typically handle that when you feel like you've really done the work, the brief is strong, you've leaned into it, and you're, you're delivering something on brand and on brief. And there's somebody who maybe for whatever reason, is, is creating tension. Talk a little bit about, you know, your process of, of working through that with them. Yes. So you're talking about like when you have to do a big presentation, there are multiple uh, stakeholders in the room and everybody's got to weigh in on something. Inevitably, if the group is big enough, there's always one cynical person. This, uh, we refer to them as the cynical skeptic. No matter what you do, they've seen it. It's not good enough. It's not tricky enough, whatever it is, because they pride themselves on their ability to just tear everything apart. Mm. I think sometimes in corporate culture, it's better for you to be the person who kills everything than the one person who says, you know what, let's champion that, because now you put your neck out on the chopping block if it doesn't work out. So in corporate culture, there always tends to be at least one person in that room. 
So typically what we do is if we know we're going to present and it's a big room, what I do is I call them out before it even starts. I say typically whenever I present, there's always one person who is super skeptical. I just describe exactly what I just said to you. What I'm asking for you while we present is just give us the benefit of the doubt for like 30 seconds. Just hang in there with us. Go with the narrative flow. And if when we're done talking about this and you're still skeptical and you have new ideas you want to offer, I'm more than happy to tell you. Because if you kill it before it starts, what's the point? You've always just wasted a lot of time and money. And so inevitably, they all look around the room and everybody already knows who I'm talking about. Sometimes they know, (laughs) oftentimes they do not know it's them, right? And so at least then I prepared so that one of two things will happen. One, they'll keep an open mind and they'll accept the idea and they're like, yeah, that's good. Okay, cool. Now they don't want to say anything bad because they've already been put on notice. Or two, they didn't even hear it. They're going to say what they're going to say. But everybody in the room suddenly becomes aware that this person never gave the idea a shot. Now, that's how I would set the stage. But now it's going to get into objection handling. So they're going to say something. And what you need to do is hopefully prepare beforehand to say, what are the three things that they're going to say to kill this thing, torpedo it? And how, how are we going to respond? And then you have a plan. And who's going to respond to that? And what's the one thing that we can't think of that they're going to say that's going to kill this whole thing? And we try to strategize around that. But once you're there and they bring up the objection, I think the best thing that you can do, and it's a, it's a thing that I teach in objection handling, is you embrace and then you pivot. You embrace and then you pivot. Okay, so first they need to be heard. So if you don't respond, if you don't acknowledge them, they're going to keep saying it louder and louder and they're going to dig their heels in. And once they're in... Because of the law of consistency, they cannot change their mind even when they know they're wrong. Hmm. So first thing you acknowledge. So if they say, you know what, I'm not sure this is going to work. So you could say, Bob, I hear you. What part of this doesn't work for you? So they don't have to, So what we're going to do is we're going to de-escalate. We're going to walk them back from negative, walk them slowly towards neutral, and potentially leave them positive. And so they're going to say something like, um, you know, it feels like this thing. And, you know, those things are hard to combat. Like, oh, we've seen something like this before. It's like, okay, where have you seen this? And how often have you seen this idea? And have you ever seen an idea that you've not seen before? Mm. So I try to use questions as a, as a means to, uh, to, um, to address their objections, objection handling. And then really what happens is you start to realize people don't really think about the things they say. They just say them and they're never ever challenged or questioned. And when you just ask them a few questions, they will then slowly, hopefully, give up their position because it's not that really well thought out. And that's all I try to do is just ask them more questions like, okay, so everything's been done or nothing's new or what are we talking about here? And if you saw something new, would you be happy because it would be so new nobody would understand it? So really, you know, then they were like, you know what? You have some good points. Okay. Uh, I'm okay with this. Let's try it. That's usually how you handle it. Yeah, this is great, man. Great content. So I want to I want to keep this sort of this energy going, and I'm gonna uh, three questions. I guess is is we'll start with the first one. Um, what do you if you had one thing? Okay, so you've you've got this body of educational uh, content you're putting out there. You've got all these things, right? And and people might come to 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 your resources and they're like what where do i start you know like what you know here i am i'm a freelance designer or i'm just getting started you whatever it might be what do you say to that that person who's new in the game maybe they just graduated college design school whatever that might be and you've got one thing for you got one you're only allowed to give them one thing all right so what's the most valuable thing for that new person coming into this industry that you're going to give them Right now, what's the one thing that you want to tell them as they begin their journey? Okay, the one thing I would tell them is uh, to be flexible, to be curious, and try things without overly committing to anything. In the first part of your career, coming out of school, you need to try lots of stuff. You might go out there thinking Helvetica is my typeface and vanilla is always my ice cream, and um, you know a, a brown colored Porsche is the thing. That's it. And I, I just say, you know, you're too new. You're too new. Just go and try lots of things and do not overcommit to realize that your time to sort it all out is long. But if you overcommit to one thing, you all of a sudden box yourself and paint yourself into the corner. So you might think, I like interactive design. I might I like video game design or I might like advertising. I don't know. But right now you should try. 
I mean, I think it's pretty archaic of a, of a concept these days to say, you know what, the first person you see on the street, you should marry them. Yeah. And everybody would just laugh at you, like, why would I do that? I'm like, okay, well, don't treat your career, your life, and everything that you do that, like that. Just because that's what you started with doesn't mean that's where you end. In fact, many people change their careers and pursue different things. The point of it all is to figure that out earlier than later because time is not on your side. So what you want to do is you want to play, you want to explore, be curious, stay flexible until you start to get a feel and have a more informed point of view before you make that decision like, okay, it feels like I want to go all in on this. That's the first piece of advice I'd give them. Great. All right, that's good feedback. Now let's let's jump into the old cats, the the guys who've been and girls who've been in this for a minute. They're maybe they're uh, you know a, a ACD, maybe they're uh, senior copywriter, maybe they're a copy director, you know, maybe they're they're at the top of their game. They're the executive creative director. What do you say to them? What's the thing they need to hear? You got one thing to give them. What yep. do they need to hear? You've been you've been in this game for a long time now. What do you say to them? Oddly enough, it's going to sound very similar to the first piece of advice. And as you're listening, you might find <laughs> the nuance. Or you might say, this guy's saying the same thing over and over. What I would say here is that uh, there's an expression. It goes something like this. Um, change is inevitable. Progress is a choice. And that as you've go- grown deeper into your career, you've deformed many specific habits and ways of looking at the world. You, you would go you fall back on the kinds of strategies that worked in the past, maybe same spaces of inspiration, and you start to dismiss all the new things that are coming up as, meh, it's a fad. And, you know, I think at one time somebody said, um, I forget who it was, but computers are a fad. Well, and then you move on. The internet is a fad. Social media is a fad. Well, it's not a fad. It's new. And in order for you to stay at least young in, at heart and young in mind is to be able to stay flexible it's okay for you to say 80% of the world I know works this way, but keep it 20% open so that when you are open to new influences, new ideas, and new art, that way you stay fresh because the kids are going to always be chomping at your feet trying to offer you new things and you might wind up as being a relic. You be, you become that thing that you hated when you started, that old guard, that, that the people who, who are married to, to tradition and dogma. You've become that person and inadvertently you woke up one day and you, you're that guy or you're that gal. So in, in this way, you, you should explore. You should always be thinking, well, if my industry is disrupted, what does that look like? And plan for that so that you're part of the change and not the person that gets replaced by the change. Mm. All right. That's good. That's good. There's, there's two, two for two. So this next question is, is going to be maybe challenging. Uh, what do you say to yourself? You've had a, a successful career. You've, you've worked for brands, you've launched your, your media company where you're helping people to you know, educate people to, do, to get paid what they love to do for a living. Um, but what about you? I mean, somebody who's giving so much of themselves to others, how do you stay fulfilled yourself? So I guess what's, the, what's your feedback to yourself? The one thing that you're trying to listen to internally right now, what's that? I think it's, uh, I'm going to cheat here a little bit. It's not exactly one thing, but uh, I, I recently wrote a post on this. I want you to think of your life like a bicycle. And the bicycle works with two wheels. One wheel doesn't work so well. Uh, three wheels is a different thing. It, it needs two wheels. And it, it's usually driven when you're young through passion. So that's the back wheel, the thing that pedals and pushes you forward, the thing that literally drives you. And then the front wheel is what steers you. That's your purpose. And you need those two to work in concert. If purpose is turned to the side, you're going to be just, uh, you're going to be running around in a circle because you don't know what it is that you want. So purpose guides while passion drives. And you need to have both of those in alignment. And to understand that you may not want, know what the purpose is until later in your life. Like for me, it's into my 40s. I'm starting to figure this thing out. Like, you know what? I'm done chasing uh, the money. I'm done chasing the fame and the fortune, all those kinds of things. I've, I got as much as I want. I'm good. What is the next thing? And so when you get to that point, you start to think about the life, the impression that you want to leave on the planet before you expire. I think you get one shot at this life, make the most of it. So for me, it's the purpose that keeps me in moving in a specific direction and is connected to my passion. And when those two work together in concert, you can go really far, baby. And and you can you can outrun the best long distance runner. You could beat every single long distance runner because you're much more efficient and you're going to use your energy well. So 
Those two need to come together, purpose and passion. Think of it as a bicycle. Somebody wrote, this is psychology, spelled like cycle, C-Y-C-L-E. This is the, mm-hmm. the psychology of success. Mm. Man, good stuff, man. I, I really, really appreciate this. I know the listeners are, are taking notes and, and tuning in. And as always, you know, you've, you've always got uh, something interesting to say. So um, what do you, what's next for you? What, what, what's, what, what's the next thing? What are, is there anything that you can tease for us that you guys are, you know, uh, that you're cooking up or, you know, where do you go from here? Brandon, what is next? This, we have such a giant, huge mission, which is teach a billion people. I, I probably could live multiple lifetimes and still fall, fall short of achieving that goal. So for mm-hmm. me, it's always thinking about how do we challenge ourselves? How do we continue to grow? And when we hit certain uh, plateaus, it, it's scary for me. Whether our, it's just the end of our reach or can we speak about other things? How do we grow this company? Because in order for this to work, we have to be better teachers. We have to learn how to play in the different social platforms. And they're constantly evolving, changing with the algorithm and people's uh, tastes and what they like to use. They're very fickle. So the advice that I gave to you, both for young people and for older people, has to apply to me as well. Right now, I still want to try lots of things. And I also want to keep an open mind and not be swallowed up by progress because I'm too proud to evolve. So I'm going to keep an eye on that as well. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that want to want to be a part of your mission. Um, so it could be brands, could be other creatives, could be other agencies. Uh, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you to, to be able to connect in, in like-minded ways? Yes, thank you very much for asking that question. We'd love your help. We'd love your help in any which way that you can tap into what it is that we're doing. The best place to go is to go to thefuture.com. Uh, the future is spelled without an E. Somebody had asked me a while ago, why is the future not spelled with the E? Where did the E go? And I said, you know what? We dropped the E go. That's why there's no E. So it's F-U-T-U-R, <laughs> thefuture.com. You can find me pretty much on every single show, social platform that exists, and probably with the exception of TikTok. I still can't figure that one out yet, but I'm at the Chris Doe. D-O is my last name. You can send me a DM, and I'd be more than happy to hear from you. Love to work with sponsors who want to be part of this dream of ours. Teachers love you. Students, all of you. Anybody that wants to help us with this, this big challenge of education in the 21st century, I would love your help. Thank you. Man, that's that's so great, and I appreciate you for coming on the show. And uh, man, uh, what a great conversation! And I wish you guys the best of luck with your big giant mission. And uh, thanks so much for creating the content. I'm a I'm a a follower as well, so I, I watch the videos and I steal some tips and tricks along the way. So thank you for that, man. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Brandon. It does sound like you have watched a few of our videos with those very specific references, and I'm impressed. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, man. All right. Well, I'm sure we'll collide or uh, we'll touch base at some point in, uh, on the internets or whatnot, and uh, we'll keep in touch. But thanks again, and uh, we really appreciate you so much. If you have appreciated this conversation today, as always, do the thing. Subscribe on uh, iTunes, Spotify, all the stuff. Share with your friends and and all that jazz. We're going to keep doing it every other week here at A Quick Read Podcast. See you in two. Hey there. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you did, please subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Join the conversation on Instagram at A Quick Read Podcast. See you in two. A Quick Read is a Leap Group Podcast. Podcast.